Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Norm Fazekas, Chris Allen, and Chris Smith. Coming up on DTNS today, Starbucks gets into NFTs, of course. Roku has some big hardware and software updates. And the MetaQuest Pro headset is found, maybe, in a hotel room. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, September 12th, 2022. From Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Raffalino. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Well, we've got all sorts of stuff to talk about. we got hardware announcements. We have hardware found in hotel rooms. <laughs> you never know where you're going to get on a Monday. But let's start with a few tech things you should know. Google spun out a new company called Aleria, which offers a light laser technology called Tightbeam, as well as a software platform to manage hyperfast, ultra secure, and highly complex communications networks that span land, sea, air, near space, and deep space. It currently has a commercial contract with the U.S. Defense Innovation Unit. Google retains a minority stake in the company, but this isn't under the Alphabet umbrella. This is a spun out company. In other Google news, The Verge reports the company has canceled the next version of its Pixelbook laptop and dissolved the team, building it as a cost cutting measure. Members of the team are said to be transferred into other Google projects. Streamer Tyler Blevins, you might know him better as Ninja, announced he didn't sign an exclusive streaming deal with Twitch or even another platform. Instead, he will now simulcast streams to Twitch, to YouTube, to TikTok, to Instagram, to Twitter, and also to Facebook. Left out LinkedIn, I feel bad, I guess. Oh, Poor LinkedIn. <laughs> if you talk, I don't think he's a LinkedIn guy. <laughs> <laughs> Ubisoft will bring three new mobile titles to Netflix subscribers. This includes a new Assassin's Creed mobile title, as well as sequels to Valiant Hearts and the Mighty Quest for Epic Loot. All three will be available in 2023. Nintendo will hold its direct uh, direct showcase on September 13th at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, promising roughly 40 minutes of information mostly focused on Nintendo Switch games launching this winter. The event will stream on Nintendo's YouTube channel, except in the UK, as a mark of respect during this period of national mourning, says Nintendo. Ford Motor Company, which owns Lincoln Motor Company, has introduced the 2023 Ford Mustang Mach-E and 2023 Lincoln Corsair SUVs, which will be the first vehicles available with Ford Blue Cruise 1.2 and Lincoln, Lincoln Active Glide 1.2, both part of an upgraded package that will extend to other models eventually. Ford has been upgrading its map systems with advanced driver assistance features designed to work on more than 130,000 miles of divided highways, including hands-free lane changing, which can also suggest when the vehicle should change lanes in slow-moving traffic. Predictive speed assist adjusts the vehicle's speed when approaching sharp curves, though it, uh, though it's, uh, it, it signals the driver before doing so. <laughs> well, that, that'd be nice. Yeah, exactly. As long as drivers are in the yeah, the, uh, the the driver's seat, you know, it, it would be nice to uh, have a heads up about that. All right, Rich, let's talk about where Zoom might be going. Yeah, you know, I mean, we seemed like we were talking about Zoom all the time and, uh, you know, in a certain period in 2020 when uh, I was starting to work from home and certainly spurred on by pandemic related necessity, Zoom went from being kind of a corporate back end service, you know, maybe use it at work to a household name over the last three years. For many, uh, this ends with Zoom just being a video chat host, and that's certainly the bread and butter of the business uh, as, as its business services. But the company also offers other communication services that maybe don't get as much press. Those don't seem to be getting the attention Zoom wants, so it's trying to rebrand its overall communication suite. Yeah, so Zoom already offered a communication suite called Zoom Chat. You might be familiar, but if you aren't, it works similar to something like Slack or Microsoft Teams. But now it's renaming it to Zoom Teams Chat, because <laughs> I guess Zoom Slack Chat would just be too on the nose. Um, I don't know how upset Microsoft is about this, but going forward, this isn't just a new name for the service, because Zoom also plans to roll out some new features over the course of September these features are based around letting you do more productivity tasks from Teams chat. So it's not just about video chat. 
Teams chat is about all sorts of other things. One is that in-meeting chats can now be shared to channels. Another is that users can now schedule Zoom meetings directly within Teams chat. Yeah, and this is what's getting the headlines today, like this specific kind of rebranding, but it's part of a wider move by the company to increase awareness around the breadth, uh, breadth of its services. Uh, in an interview with Fast Company, CEO Eric Yoon said that the company is looking to expand into new avenues, and CFO Kelly uh, Steckelberg framed it that we're striving, uh, what we're striving for is becoming the operating system for your workday, and part of this is they have yeah. a new corporate logo with a bunch of Zoom has a bunch of O's and each one is their own little, you know, own little service that they have. And that's um, like, OK, fine. You know, somebody, you know, <laughs> your graphics team did some nice work. <laughs> that's great. I think that, you know, what what always bothered me and, you know, we're going to the early days of the pandemic where everybody Zoom became that like Kleenex, uh, you know, sort of brand name for just video chats. You can do lots of things and you don't have to use Zoom to do that. But so many people just started to use Zoom as this ubiquitous word for what we're all trying to do when we're all stuck at home in our underwear kind of thing. <laughs> and I mean, that, that, that still is the case, but you always had a lot of other options. Well, so for Zoom to be like, well, yeah, we're you know still good with that, but as life goes on, we have a suite of other products that you would be interested in, and you don't have to use Microsoft Teams. You don't have to I, use Slack. You can just use our suite. I, I will add that uh, Zoom, not not to sell them short, they, they developed a product that was easily uh, 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 <clears throat> that was easily shared across multiple mm -hmm. workspaces. So you didn't need, for example, we've all used Skype. You got to get Skype. Uh, sure. app running and you have a bunch of uh, configuration needs to do zoom was very here's the link uh you click on it and you can watch in fact uh you know this past friday i, I attended a a family um funeral and it was streamed using uh, uh zoom and so it was a very very no nonsense very simple way to engage a bunch of people but uh zoom over the past Ever since like the at the end of the, the last half of two thousand one, their growth rate in revenue has hasn't has dipped uh, considerably, and of course a lot of it has to do with you know the bump that you got with the pandemic. But th they're definitely in a position where we, I think they want to they think that they need to start cementing out uh, their other products in people's minds, so that when the time comes, they have more to lean on instead of just this one product. Well, and it's it's interesting to talk about both, uh, uh, sl excuse me, uh, Zoom and Skype because you know back up until 2020, if you were talking about VoIP calling, usually you say, "Oh, I Skype somebody" or something like that. It had that Kleenex level name recognition. But the simple fact is, as an enterprise service, like Zoom has never pivoted to being a consumer service. Like they've they've offered some consumer like, but I safeguards. think they already were one. They didn't I, have I, to pivot to be one. They just realized, but, oh. People but they're monetizing like one part of our, you know, offering. Their monetization is still very much. We are an enterprise service. Everything else that we're going to be getting from a consumer level is peanuts compared to what we would be getting uh, when we're talking about huge enterprise contracts and stuff like that. Right. So, like that name recognition, while it's it's great for them, I think they're realizing that that doesn't save them from being the next Skype where. OK, yeah, everybody uses yeah. us for their free call for their family, but then they don't pay for it or they only pay for like the most basic plan. And every other competing service that offers either some sort of communication suite or some sort of video chat calling service has a variety of different like they can use all of those different pieces as funnels to more subscription services. Yeah. So you're talking about Microsoft Teams. You're talking about, uh, you know, Slack is now owned by Salesforce. That CRM is, is like the biggest funnel ever to well, like kind of going both ways. So they have a lot of now competition that they, you know, the, the, the competitive landscape has changed where that name recognition is certainly valuable. Uh, but it doesn't make C it doesn't make, you know, CTOs or, or CIOs I mean, sign contracts. I, I can't tell you how many Slack well, I mean, okay, there are only a few of them, but like Slack channels that I'm in, we're we're not paying for anything. You know? <laughs> well, you that's get, the problem you, Slack also is, yes. You, you yeah. get the notification every so often of like, well, you only have this many megabytes of, you know, uh <laughs> onboard storage. It's like it doesn't matter. We're just, you know, chatting throughout the day. It's all good. I feel like Slack and Teams, Microsoft Teams, uh, just have that corporate infrastructure built into, you know, 
That is what they're known for. Whether you want to use it or not, it's still what they're known for. Well, I would not have said um, before kind of looking at what it seems like Zoom is doing going forward that Zoom would have been in that same category, but the company obviously wants to be. Yeah, And and I think, Rich, you kind of hit the nail on the head. There, there's very much a value add to the Slack and the Teams in that it's a suite of, uh, it's a suite of collaboration tools Plus this, you know, video conferencing that enables you to do all this stuff without necessarily jumping outside their particular ecos ecosystem in order to do it. And Zoom wants to make sure that people they, they want to maintain the stickiness of their product, yeah. right? And to do that, they need to offer additional products that make that are value added, that basically multiply the uh, the, the the compelling nature of their product. This is the problem that Slack fundamentally had, is that Microsoft could add Teams as a free add-on to something you were already going to pay for, and then all of a sudden they can start growing this huge market share, right? And that's, I, I, I believe that's why they ended up getting bought. I mean, obviously, they, it, was a, it was a huge acquisition. People weren't shedding too many tears, but I think it was like $27 billion. Uh, but Zoom could be in that same, Zoom could be in that same position where, a lot there's a lot of other uh, you know, productivity ecosystems out there that can throw in video conferencing as that add-on so having that as your only kind of funnel into their subscription system increasingly probably doesn't make a lot of sense and that's probably and and that's certainly why i think that they are trying to see hey we have a lot of different avenues we're we're an overall productivity suite we want to be this operating system you know i, I don't think that's uh, uh you know kind of going after microsoft's lunch and a number of verbiage levels uh, isn't an accident by any stretch of the imagination well, speaking of productivity suites, Roku is definitely in that market. But before we get to some software announcements, the company updated its entry-level streaming service, the $30 Roku Express. Set-top streaming box still only handles 1080p streams. It's okay for most people. You might want 4K, though. But it now supports dual-band Wi-Fi and includes more on-device storage. That will be a welcome uh, addition to some folks. Available for pre-order now, shipping October 13th. Roku also released a new $130 Roku wireless base with 120 watts of peak power and ability to sync with the company's various soundbar and wireless speaker products, shipping November 7th. But on the software side, the company announced some significant upgrades coming with the release of OS 11.5. This is still coming down uh, in the next couple of months, but they're letting us know some of the features now. This will see Roku trying to get into the short form video game, or at least highlighting it on their platform. They're adding a new section called The Buzz, which contains short form promotional content from various streaming channels. You may say, okay, what is that going to look like? Things like trailers, interviews, content clips, and it's gonna you're you're gonna be able to see like the channel information from where it's from, so you can save those channels or shows. So if they show you a trailer for something, you say, "Oh, let me save that. I want to watch that later." Give you a little interactivity to stuff you might already be watching on YouTube or something like that. Yeah. So the Roku OS, the new one, uh, is also looking to revamp the what to watch screen. So if you're a Roku user. You'll get a continue watch option that supports content on the Roku channel, Netflix, HBO Max, Paramount Plus. Also adds a revamped save lists, which used to be limited to the Roku channel, but will now support platform wide content. So you have a little bit more options as a uh, as a uh, as a person who loves good content. This could also be used to save content currently available for purchase or rent and then see when it hits a streaming service. So then you can jump on that. The OS also adds a new live TV guide on its mobile app remote, which will aggregate content from the Roku channel, over-the-air content from a connected tuner, ad-supported video on-demand channels, and premium subscription channels launched from its subscription platform. So you kind of have to be within that ecosystem. It can't be stuff you're subscribed to otherwise. But a lot of uh, updates coming to kind mm -hmm. of cement Roku as this as this major aggregator for for all your streaming needs here. Uh, now, Sarah, you're not a, a Roku user. Does any of this make you kind of want to jump ship? What? No. Um, so most of all media that I uh, consume goes through Plex, um, through a variety of media servers. Um, and Plex has kind of not... Plex and Roku are, are not the same thing because you don't subscribe to Plex. You know, this is these are media servers that you know exist otherwise that are going through um, this particular you know kind of way to make it pretty and you know look nice and and be able to look for things. 
Roku, I used to use uh, back in the day when HBO, was it HBO Now or it was HBO Now that was only available on Roku before it was available on Apple TV, right? Okay. I have that right? Anyway, so back in the day, there was a need for me to use Roku. And I kind of went back and forth. Over time, I just kind of went to Apple TV. I felt like that was, you know, the platform that I needed. But uh, I, you know, going back to the Plex thing, Plex also does a lot of the stuff like Plex's top picks or, you know, just, you know, get getting into Plex tonight type thing. And it's all designed to, and I think Roku is doing the same thing, you know, uh, taking care of the consumer who's like, well, okay, I have this. What do I watch? You know, what's here? Um, if I know what I want to watch, then that's, you know, you, you, th that's already been answered. But if you don't, to have a little bit of a curated thing, I think most companies are doing this, and that seems like what Roku is doing. Yeah, it's. Now. There's some interesting moves. I am a, a Roku user. I have a, a TCL uh, a TV that uh, I, I love the interface. I think it works really well, but I never, ever use the what to watch screen. I'm mostly just like, I know exactly what I kind of want to yeah. jump into or, or just, I don't yeah, think you kind of go past that stuff. Well, I, I, I don't think that's going to be a place. I think that's going to be like the YouTube explore page where I'm going to be like, Oh, like this is maybe some like stuff. I'm like the, the first time I'm served something I don't want to watch is like, I will never click on that again. Right. So the, like the, the fact that this could, what, what really is interesting to me is the save list where there are so many times where it's like, Oh, there's a show I want to watch. I don't know if I want to subscribe to this yet, but like when you finish a series, you can kind of check back on what you want to watch and go back to that and say, oh, it changed. It either changed streaming providers or it was something that was I had to buy outright. And now I can kind of add that, uh, you know, it's already part of another service that I'm paying for. Like I, I, I've thought for a while that Roku has not uh, uh, leaned heavily enough on its ability to be an aggregator, even though it is getting into content. It still kind of has a unique position in the market. And these seem to be like them like, OK, we need to step it's, on that gas. And I. I would add uh, this is not unlike what uh, Google has done with Google TV as they trans transition away from Android TV to Google TV. One of the first things you notice is there's a there, there's a section on the screen that literally shows you what's coming up next, even on services you don't yet you don't yet or haven't subscribed or installed Ooh, the app. Yeah, for. well, that's so, how they get you. Yeah. Well, this is the idea: is that hey. By by doing this, Roku, of like what Rich was saying, you know, Roku OS isn't just the dongle. It isn't just the box you buy as a as a stocking stuffer. It's built into a number of smart TVs. My my parents have one, and it's really simple to set up. And once you do, it carries with that account. So as long as you use that same account, it will have all the st same stuff yeah. on it. And so I, I see it as just a way to kind of make it more engaging and make it more valuable for other apps. So, hey, don't want to make sure you make your app compatible with our OS because there's plenty of people who want to watch it. And we have this way to kind of get people hooked up on your brand new service that maybe you haven't told them yet, but we can tell them, hey, Game of Thrones is on. Even though you don't have HBO Max, maybe you should subscribe and you can watch it. House of the Dragon, Roger. House, House of the Dragon. Dragon. Hey, listen. There's uh, but salt. but uh, you know, all kidding aside, the more we talk about this, the more I'm like, oh, Roku is the new Plex server. That's what they're doing. It's just that they also sell you hardware and you know some kind of Roku specific stuff. But for anybody who's like, and I think that's what we're talking about now. It's like, well, I've got Netflix. I have HBO Max. I might have Disney Plus. Paramount Plus, variety of other things. Where does it all consolidate into one place that makes sense for Roger's parents? This is a good one. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's a turnkey solution. I mean, Plex yeah. isn't isn't hard to use, but it's a little more involved there's, than my yeah, there's than a, my parents yeah. just turning on the TV and they're instantly presented with all that information. Exactly. Well, if you have thoughts on anything that we've talked about thus far on this show, you probably have thoughts about media servers because we know you. Join the conversation in our Discord, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Well, back in the misty past of yore, long before NFC-based phone payments became ubiquitous, Starbucks figured out a way to get people to pay with their phones using the Starbucks mobile app. Part of this was convenience. Bar Starbucks' barcode scanning payments got you through your drive through order just a little bit faster. But another big part of it was the company's rewards program. 
giving customers points to earn stars to help feed their coffee and snack habits. You know, you can get uh, uh, just all sorts of, you know, free goodies. If you, if you're a daily drive through user, you're getting some free stuff uh, at some point. So any change to that rewards program is going to be big news for coffee devotees. Yeah. And Starbucks was really at the forefront, especially during the pandemic of saying, you know what, just order something ahead of time. Come on in, you know, no contact. We are good. So with that in mind, Starbucks will open a wait list for something called Starbucks Odyssey on September 12th, combining its Starbucks reward program, which is quite popular, with an NFT platform on the Polygon blockchain. This will build on it, it, its existing rewards program using its existing logins. So if you're like, mm, NFTs, crypto, I don't know, you don't actually have to do anything. And that's sort of the point. Starbucks eventually wants to deeply integrate the two. However, it is intentionally keeping mention of Web3, <laughs> which a lot of people either don't understand or find to be, you know, a little bit daunting, far away from the customer experience that it already has with Odyssey. So kind of how this will work is logging into the Odyssey web app will let users play either interactive games or do challenges to earn NFTs dubbed journey stamps. Limited edition NFTs will be available for purchase using a standard credit card, so no crypto wallet required, Phil Collins style. These stamps can be sold on a marketplace in the app with a portion of proceeds donated to causes chosen by Starbucks employees and customers. We don't know the percentage or much details about that. More no, no, more no details available uh, as we go on here. Collecting stamps will gain points, kind of similar to you get points per buying stuff, you buy NFTs, you get points, which can be used to unlock exclusive benefits, not just like free stuff in store. However, these are things like they were talking about virtual classes, unique merch, and even special event access. Yeah. So I, I am a person who doesn't go to a Starbucks all that often. Uh, so, you know, my first reaction was like, well, so like what kind of perks? Well, a lot of this still being figured out, such as which challenges the company is going to set up for, you know, what kind of customers, as well as the price, quantity of initial limited NFTs, and who gets what? Do you pay for it outright? Do you just buy enough fraps, <laughs> get an NFT? The company plans to launch Odyssey later this year for people on the wait list, so you can sign up now, uh, before a full public launch next year. But I th feel like there are a lot of questions still to be answered, Rich. Yeah. And Roger, just in our prep for this, you asked the most pertinent question, like what does what does the blockchain do for Starbucks that they weren't already doing on their rewards program? And I mean, I don't th I mean, I obviously, Starbucks has an answer to this. If they wanted to make a big NFT splash, they would have launched this like the day after the Super Bowl, which was like the peak you know, NFT crypto watermark for that we like before kind of the crypto, you know, crypto winner that we're in right now. But they waited to like almost the low point of the market to to kind of wade into these waters when people would perhaps be at their most skeptical. So, I, I mean, clearly they have an answer to this. What what I think is an interesting element to this is it almost taps into Starbucks as this like like lifestyle brand like there are people that like I have to go to the Starbucks every single day it's you know like just the way that like yeah Duncan or it's part of your morning commute which like, is why their loyalty program on the app has been yeah. so successful yeah. you could argue that Starbucks was kind of ahead of the curve on a lot of the stuff the fact that the company is like okay we have all these people who are using our app on a daily basis they love you know you know you you buy four uh, coffees then maybe you get a mug or a sandwich or whatever afterwards whatever that is the nft version of this to introduce more kind of lifestyle experiences this is where sometimes they lose me because I'm like, well, wh but like what, what, what is the well, lifestyle experience besides like a free coffee? I mean, is, is there a back end thing where they're essentially offloading some of the rewards management onto a blockchain run by, uh, uh run by a Paragon, uh, polygon yeah. so that they, no, that, that they, they don't necessarily have to They have don't, the but it's like, but if it's not a hit with customers, I, 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 yeah, I mean, like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, long. is there, is there, is there a thing where people little double dip on Starbucks rewards that they want to avoid by issuing NFTs or, 
because I as so. I mean, as Rich no, was saying, I think they're trying to be. I think they're just trying to, you know, look outside the box. Starbucks has this. Um, this uh, uh, depending on where you live, they have a chain of kind of high end Starbucks places called Starbucks Reserve, mm. and I used to live pretty close to one it was nice you know it felt like a you know kind of like a almost a nightclub more than you know your standard starbucks on the corner and i could see where there's a certain amount of clientele who would be interested in maybe having you know a sommelier come in one night and you know you get to be part of a you know a, a, a exclusive group who's there and because you know you that's the NFT that you have. I can see that, but I feel like that's pretty few and far between for Starbucks in general. Well, I, I will say, I feel like one of the reasons they waited on this one, obviously they wanted to make sure this wouldn't, you know, kind of all of our points, they don't want to mess up the rewards program. That's like a golden goose for them. They don't want to mess that up. But the right. other element that I think they they were waiting for is for there to be, you know, kind of the early question with NFTs, like, what do you do with this? Like, you just put it up on your monitor or something like that. And we're, even though a lot of places are rolling back on like at, at very ambitious NFT plans, a lot of social networks now will let you throw up an NFT, you have their profile picture and, and that kind of stuff. So there, there are more places at least to put that. And in a way that uh, it, it, I don't, you know, I don't know how much uh, uh, Starbucks is going to be into the NFT aesthetic uh, that's kind of uh, become almost passe now at this point, but like there is at least more avenues, you know, you could hook them up to send them to your LG TV. Uh, you know, they have crypto wallets now. So there are like, there are actually like places to display them. If you are the person that lines up every year for the Starbucks holiday mug, you might also be the person that does the challenge. Totally. So you can get your Starbucks NFT. Totally. Yeah. I, I, I think there are those, those types of uh, Starbucks enthusiasts uh, out there that would be totally down for this. Oh man. I mean, I am not one of them, mostly because I just don't live near a Starbucks. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> and we would love to know a little bit more about, you know, if you're kind of like, listen, I go to Starbucks enough that I get rewards. And I'm really into this new loyalty program that might, you know, give me some, uh, you know, s some extra perks via NFT that I hadn't had before. Uh, please do let us know. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. All right, so we might have just gotten a view of Meta's next generation Quest headset, courtesy of Facebook post Ramiro Cardenas. Now, this is a little potentially sus, but hear me out. He posted pictures of multiple devices left in a hotel room labeled as engineering samples. Okay. Pictures show a black headset with three cameras on the front, new circular controllers with packaging showing the name MetaQuest Pro. Seems pretty legit, right? Equipment looks similar to a leaked Meta instructional video. However, we have no comment from Meta. The device wasn't shown powered on, and it's hard to say if this is a real thing or some sort of stunt of some kind. Cardenia says that the room's occupant later claimed the headsets. So there's that. How, how great would it be if the person that left this in the hotel room was the same person that left that iPhone in That's that bar? That's what I was thinking. It was the <laughs> iPhone 4, right? Like it was yeah. like, I, you know, some years ago it was like, oh man, after all of this, some idiot just left an iPhone in a bar and now we all know what it looks like. I am just not convinced that these things are not all stunts. Come on. And and as much as we all love, oh, we, uh, we love the leaked renders that get out there. We love, oh, we got the leaked photos. This does not tell us anything that we haven't already. It's either seen in leaks or in the weird blurry promo video that Facebook that Facebook itself or Meta itself put out there for this headset. Like it doesn't tell us anything new about the capabilities. Doesn't tell us anything new about the hardware. If they could, if they sent it to iFixit and they tore it down and we got all sorts of inside of SOCs and stuff, I'd be excited. This to me, I, if if even if this is legit. I, I get, I am very skeptical. I'm surprised it got the amount of run that it did other than- Oh gosh, it was, yeah. Like the hotel room aspect is the notable thing about this. It's not like we have a picture of it. Listen, I've left all sorts of things in hotel rooms, you know? You're trying to make a flight, it happens. It. That said, <laughs> this just seems a little too perfect mm -hmm. uh, to get mm -hmm. a lot of buzz on a Monday.
Uh, but let's go to the mailbag because you always uh, send us lots of great stuff. This one comes from Paul, and this was in response to our conversation yesterday following Apple's new announcement about the Apple Watch uh, uh, pl- Plus? Apple Watch Ultra. 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 Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, I haven't bought one, so I don't know. Paul says, I'm an Apple Watch user, been one since the beginning, but also a pretty hardcore runner. So I kept using a Garmin until the Nike Apple Watch with GPS, and that was good enough in 99% of the cases. With the Series 4, talking about the Apple Watch, I bought the fancy stainless steel expensive version watch to wear every day, and then a new Nike Series 4 to use for running. But a few years ago, I fell on a run, shattered against a curb. Since then, I've been using that stainless steel watch for running, and it's been fine. Though at this point, running a full marathon would pretty much drain the entire battery. But like others, I've been hoping that the new watch would be a new style. I was mentally prepared to spend a bunch of cash and get a new high-end version of the watch for my everyday use and then retire my old fancy watch to just be for running. Paul says, ironically, the Ultra has flipped this plan upside down for me because I pretty much entirely ordered the Ultra to be my new running watch and I'm looking forward to putting the fancy band back on and just using my stainless steel and using it as my everyday, everyday wear watch. The Ultra may be expensive, says Paul, but a new version of the stainless steel watch starts at the same price. Comes in a cheaper uh, version than some of the high-end Garmin's. Those can run as high as $1,500. This is what I needed to hear. Paul, thank you so much for writing in because this is one of the few tech products that like I can't like visualize myself using it's just like not for my needs so like i i love hearing the runner's use case for this and uh i'm i'm so sorry you you broke your watch that makes me very sad i know i know bummer but uh yeah think how oh, whoa whoa otis um sorry about that uh paul thank you so much for for the uh response uh, especially for somebody who is Definitely putting their watch through, you know, marathon type yeah. stuff. You know, I don't know, Rich, how much, how many marathons you're running these days, but I'm not running very many. Um, you know, so I, I, I definitely try to kind of like push my Apple Watch to its fullest, but at the same time, just knowing what kind of what uh, what people need, and mm-hmm. especially that that Garmin uh, set of folks saying. You know, if you really care about fitness this much, you got to go with this type of thing. You know, Apple's obviously honing in on that uh, that set. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for the email. And thanks to our brand new bosses, Alex, Eric, and James, who just started backing us on Patreon. Woo! Thank you, Alex. Thank you, thank Eric. You, Eric. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. Uh, we love to get new patrons. Um, thank you so much for everybody who joined us over the weekend and everybody who supports us. Speaking of patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet, which we roll into right after we wrap up DTNS. But just a reminder, if you'd like to catch the show live, audio or video, Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC, that's where you can find more about dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow talking big summer game news with IGN's Max Scoville. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>